All right. Just wanted to welcome everybody here that uh, is coming here for the Silver Bullet Live show. Uh, I'm Rob, and uh, we have three other people on the panel here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves real quick. So uh, we'll start off with Sherry. So go ahead, Sherry. Hi, this is Sherry Jensen, Silver Bullet Cutters. I just wanted to welcome everybody that is USA-based customers of mine. Welcome. All right. Uh, next on the list here is Dawn. Go ahead, Dawn. Hi. It's Dawn of Time Graphics. Welcome to any of my lot of listening. You'll only be a few because you're the night owls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, D Dawn, so I guess it's almost like 4 o'clock in the morning almost, so she's a she's a dedicated owner here. So uh, next on the list here is Michelle. Go ahead, Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. I'm SEO and SMO specialist for CivilBuilders.com. This little seminar is going to be on the tools, the tools that the silver bullet cutters have and what you can actually do with them. Okay, so last week was, you know, an introduction introduction to what the machine has and what, some of the tools that you get standard with it. And these tools are sort of like little bonus extras that you guys can get, can get for your machine. All right, so we already got the introduction. So we have Sherry. She's on the U.S. base. She's uh, that's scrapinc.com. That's where you can find all the uh cool silver bullet products on that. Uh, Dawn, she has timegraphics.co.uk, and she handles the UK-based uh, areas over there. So this machine is worldwide. And Michelle, you have michellemybellcreations.com, and of course myself, Rob. Uh, you can always find me at uh, scrappydo.com. So the first thing that we need to talk about here is the blades. So let's talk about these blades here. What kind of blades do you have? And what's the differences in these blades? The blade types we have are the 45 degree and the 60 degree. Both of these are standard blades. We generally tell people that the 45 degree blade is used for vinyl, lightweight paper. 60 degree is for cardstock up to a serial weight box of chipboard. And I'll have Dawn go over what, what she suggests for these things because the cardstock is different in the UK. The 30 degree blade here in the US, I suggest that for fabric. And the 60 degree plus long shaft blade was manufactured for thicker, denser media, such as chipboard, leather, etc. Also, the 30 degree blade, I believe that Dawn is suggesting that's used as leather, used for leather as well. And then the detail blades are 45 and 60. They cut the same products, be, meaning the vinyl, lightweight paper, cardstock. But the blade is very, very small. As you can see, it's held in by a spring, and it's in the detail blade holder, which we'll go over in a little bit. And that the, those blades were created to do extremely minute cutting. Machine performs like a laser cutter, and that blade helps you get that. So, Dawn, if you wanted to add anything for the UK? Yeah, for the UK people, 45 degree blade, vinyl paper, cardstock up to about 160 GSM. 60 degree blade, cardstock between about 160 and 350 to 400 GSM. 30 degree blade, thin fabrics, very fine media such as tissue paper. 60 plus same as Sherry said, and one further point about the detail blade, you don't see it in the pictures, but the actual blade is about a third of the width of the standard ones. Very tiny, very easy to lose those blades. We always suggest, uh, I do, changing those blades on a, a piece of fabric, or a white piece of fabric especially, or a towel of some type because those blades have a tendency to spring away and once it does it's impossible to find it so and I always suggest people if you are throwing a blade away save your spring in case you lose one at a later date they are very tiny and hard to find all right so so now we have you know the silver one here that's the one that's being shipped with the machine but now we have this you know click blade holder so go ahead and explain this for us uh, the silver one on the left hand side is the standard holder um, you'll use the plunger on the top to push that down the bag blades are all magnetized the blade goes in you release that it sucks it up inside and you'll adjust the two the, anyway the dots on the top the gold and the silver one adjust that to adjust the depth of the blade the blue one on the right is called the clip blade holder the difference between those two I tell people US based that that, that that click blade holder for us is basically a convenience product when you're doing different medias you don't have to physically adjust the blade. You just turn it from one through six uh, to get the blade to come out far enough to adjust it for the different medias that you use. Uh, there's six settings on there, as it says here, and basically for convenience. Yeah, I mean, I, I really like this click blade holder, I mean, you know, because you can extend and lower the blade so easy, depending upon what kind of media you do have, because on some media, you do want that blade to be longer, and some media, you want that blade to be a little smaller. So. And I do 
I do believe, that, Dawn, you feel that, that the click blade holder has a little bit more accuracy than the standard blade holder, is that correct? That is correct. It shows up mostly on small geometric shapes. For example, if you're cutting a lattice, you will get crisper corners and slightly better shapes with the click holder than with the standard. Yeah, uh, Gigi here, she said she's like, I'm a huge fan of the click blade holder, just love it. Yeah. So, all right, so next, next on the list here is the pen tool, okay? So... Maybe we can sort of explain the pen tool. With the pen tool, we like you to be able to use a wide variety of pens. We don't produce pens ourselves. You pick what you want to use. You're not limited. But because the pens all have different widths, they need to be centered to be accurate when they're combined with other processors, cutting, embossing, etc. So you always use the one with the largest diameter. That goes in the clamp just as your blade holders do. The other two both fit inside of that one so you, your wide one is for your wider pens as you can see over on the side it gives a diameter of 12.8 your medium one for your medium pens 11.7 and your small one 9.4 that's for your very skinny pens like your secure gel pens all right and uh, i have these photos here to show you why it's very important to use the correct size and as you can see in this photo at the left i mean it is totally off-centered uh, you know, if you were to go use this, you wouldn't, you know, to use this with a cut as well or for a project, things wouldn't line up that well. And you, you can see with the photo on the right, uh, it's just not centered. So what you have to do is you actually have to combine, find these for smaller ones. And you, you can see from this, on the left side, we combined them. And then on this top view, you can see how, how much better centered this pin is in order to use. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Dawn? It was just it was designed this way for extreme accuracy. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, as you can see, just by adding that one adapter to that uh, to that larger adapter, you have now centered that pen. So what kind of results can you expect from an off-centered pen compared to a centered pen? So so we have this right here. This this is probably what you can expect if you're trying to do a cut and a write. So the the photo that you see on the left, that's that's something that's off-centered, of course, and the one on the right is properly centered. So that's sort of why, you know, you, you need to make sure if you're using a pen tool that, that you do have the proper proper attachments and they're put in there properly. Yeah, Gary Hawkins just said that the pen tool is the best tool ever. Definitely worth getting. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. So this next, uh, I'm going to let, uh, let Dawn explain this next one. So this was done with the pen tool, right? Yep, this is done with the pen tool. I've used two different types of pens. The black one is a permanent pen. The red and the green are water soluble. So after drawing it, I've just put some drops of water on, which has allowed the color to spread as it would do with watercolor paint. So you do get a two, true drawn and painted effect rather than something that looks like it's printed. All right, so this next thing is a pretty unique tool. I, you know, I haven't heard of it until they introduced this to me, and they call it a punch tool. So go ahead, tell, tell us why you designed this thing. And well, Don and I have differing reasons for this. Again, I had a gentleman that does custom boot, boots, and they needed insert for those boots going forward, and he's using that to punch the holes in the neoprene that he cuts with our machine uh, for it to be sewed together. And uh, his wife was doing it with a hammer and an all, and and that was my reasoning once we got it done and sent to him, and that's what he's using it for. I also have a lot of people that are purchasing it and the old-fashioned oil lamp shades that people do and there was they used to hole punch those designs in them so the light would shine through those and we have a lot of people particularly South Dakota Wyoming those areas that are doing them selling them in the antique stores uh, using that same oil based paper and making lampshades out of them again using the punch tool I believe that Dawn has some different things that, that's being used for. Yes, I do. Yeah. For me, it was a lot of people wanting to do Pergamano type work, which is extremely labor intensive and time intensive. Plus, people were finding that if they had arthritis, rheumatism, etc., the, the repeated punching of holes was aggravating pain in the hands. So this gets past all that sort of problem. What what kind of tips can you give us if we're using this tool as far as what kind of force would you recommend with this as well as force speed? Tends, force tends to be fairly high to get a good clean punch through the paper. So I typically use between 200 and the full force. Speed can be variable, but keep it slower, round about the 100 or below for a nice clean punch through. 
uh, I wanted to mention too, there are three different size blades or three different size needles that come with that. So as you see this picture that Dawn has done now, uh, the smaller holes and we have a small, a medium and a large. So that's why you see the different sizes of the holes and you do get all three of those with the with the pen tool, with the punch tool. Okay, got, got a question here for you, Dawn. They want to know, uh, is a soft mat necessary for using the punch tool? I know, would you use your normal carrier mat? No. If okay. you use the normal carrier mat, then one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to blunt the tip of the needle, even possibly take the fine tip off, or you're simply not going to get a punch through. You need an embossing mat with the padded surface underneath to allow the needle to penetrate through the media properly. Okay. So, so as you can see in this photo, this is a, sort of what the punch tool does. Uh, and I mean, just like Sherry said, I mean, you can imagine those old antique lamps and making that a lampshade and having the having the light shines through this. And then I asked uh, I asked Dawn what, what the files look like with this, and this is what she came up with. So you can explain this file on the left here, Dawn. That's simply a design that I punched using the small punch hole. The centers of the feathers are just embossed, and then I've just decorated it a little with chalk over the top to bring out the different areas. All right, so I was sort of expecting when I looked at the file to see like X's, you know, little, you know, little, little X's. But Dawn was explaining this the other night. She said it's a, they're just small circles, sort of like rhinestone circles, and she's like the the needle just does a little wiggle in order to create that dot. So yeah, uh, it's the wiggle that does the magic. It's 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 all in the wiggle. So uh, that, that top top right there, that's a picture from Sure Cuts a lot. All those little green things, they automatically Sure Cuts a lot automatically puts little rubies and little rhinestones in there. The bottom right photo, that's where cut preview is. So as you can see, it's it's just small, tiny circles, and that needle's just going down and making a small circle and then coming right back up. All right, so the, the next tool that they offer uh, that we're going to talk about next is the engraving. So that's what it looks like on the on the right, and then we'll go ahead and talk about what kind of stuff we can engrave on. Okay, some of the some of the things that that we've engraved here are the acrylic metals, acetate, wood, dawn, of course, the chocolate for the chocolatiers, uh, soap, and there will be some slate examples in a little bit that dawn has done. I've not tried that myself, and then acrylic mirror diamond tip blade that is in there. I don't sell that at the store because we've never had anybody wear one out, um, and I've done ton of engraving over the last four years, and I just engraved something a week ago, and mine still in the same shape it was when, when we first put it in there, so it lasts, and until we have somebody wear one out, we just don't sell them. Because my lot manage very, very occasionally to wear one out. Mm -hmm. Generally, if they're engraving on glass, the one thing we don't recommend that you do a lot of is glass engraving. It's very, very hard even on the diamond, and generally should be done with a rotary tool rather than a drag tool. There's a question here. I'm going to back up a couple slides, and mm -hmm. I think... All right, uh, they want to know, is that the front or back of the paper? That is the underneath of the paper, so that the punches are rising up, but you can use either surface depending on the, the look that you want. The peacock feathers, for example, is the top surface, so you've got the punches going down, so it's a cleaner look. Did you guys mention anything about the engraving speed and the, and the force that you use? Engraving speed, you can go pretty fast on. I tend to engrave at full speed. Um, because the tip is just going across the surface, you don't have to have any concerns about media moving, etc. You can just whack it up and go. Yeah, so th this video that you're seeing right now is it was recorded in real time. Uh, you'll, you'll see it later on. It's going to be fast forward so you guys can see the finished product like right here. But uh, that was using max, 800. I put 800 for my speed, and that's, that's what it was going at that you guys saw at the beginning. And I just use the simple line fill that uh, Sure Cuts a lot has in it now, and this is uh, metal tile. Sherry sent me that. And and I'll add too, as far as the <laughs> force, it depends on yeah, obviously what you're what you're engraving. Again, uh, it's just kind of a trial and error thing to get used to it. But as Penny Duncan will attest to, we have that little book that you can keep track of it in, and uh, then you always know uh, what you did the last time and have that forever. All right, so here's some uh, other examples of engraving here. So I'm going to go ahead and let Dawn. This is engraving onto a sheet of acrylic Perspex, and it's done with a fill engraving, so it's got very, very tiny 
vector lines over all of it and then the colouring is done on the acid on the acrylic as well after the engraving it's done on the reverse the colouring and let me go to this next one here so go ahead and tell us talk to us about this one okay we have some jewelers and one in particular approached me because the tools that he was using to do customized names or messages onto his jewelry were a set of punches so he was very limited in the style of lettering he could use so because jewelers typically work on very small items he wanted to know just how small the text could go and so I did I did the fancy one at the top but along the bottom we've got three columns and the final one on the right is two millimeters high and the two millimeters is the upper case not the lower I didn't go any smaller than that because I wouldn't have been able to read it with my eyesight anyway <laughs> And this is exactly what we're talking about for the people that are doing dog tags and uh, and bracelets and things. This is the type of engraving that they're that they're doing uh, on those. All right, so we have some slate. Beautiful. Yes, piece of slate. You'd be quite surprised as well, actually, that even where the slate is chipped out, as long as the chip isn't too deep, it will start, still carry on engraving over it. And you can see here a good example of the difference between the line fill and the, sorry, the line and the fill engraving. The line is all the words that say just time, and the fill is on the time graphics. All right, next tool that you guys have is, of course, the embossing. Uh, the embossing tool is four tips on it. They start at one millimeter and go to four millimeters, as you can see there. They are all ball tips. The one millimeter, you can barely see that ball. And, of course, the Allen wrench is there. If you don't get a guy to have it all kit, we always ship the Allen wrench with it because you need that to put the tips in. You will receive it with two tips in, and then the other dish, two tips will be in the bag. That's U.S.-based. And, and you can. Uh, Oh, and you do yours the same, okay? So some of the things that we use it on very successfully is, is vellum. It, it does a beautiful job on vellum. Cardstock, uh, some soft metals, again, leather, and lightweight chip. And the chip are people here who are making boxes. A lot of them, the engraving tool is too much to do a score line in, and so a lot of my customers that are business owners making boxes are using the embossing tool to do their score lines. The score lines is used for more than box people. I have some origami people as well and they're using it to put a score line in anything from text weight paper up to heavy cardstock. One thing that I will point out about cardstock with that I tend to find that you get a better deboss result than you do emboss. Mm -hmm. In other words use the surface that you're working on for cardstock rather than the usually with the back piece it, you get a clearer result that way and of course you do need an embossing mat so if you're not getting the got to have it all kit you need to purchase the embossing mat to go along with this we probably should have had a diagram that, up there showing that that actually does depend on what you and what you're embossing well, if it's the leather or the soft metal you can get away quite happily with a standard mat it's correct. it's the vellum and the card stocks etc that you need the, the embossing mat for all right so uh, next we got some examples of examples of embossing all right go ahead there, Dawn. This is leather embossing. They're all fill embossing, even the texts, because to make a, a good impression in what is a fairly dense leather, you need the repeated embossing that you get with a fill. And you can do anything you want on them. It's it's a very effective thing to do on leather. Dawn, did you emboss these first and then uh, and then cut them? Yes, I emboss first and then I cut afterwards. Then can you explain to people about the coloring on them, please? One of the best ways to get a good deep embossing on leather is to have it slightly dampened. I use vegetable tan leather for embossing, which some of you will know, others may not, comes in a, a creamy beige color. So instead of just using water to soften my leather, I go ahead and add the leather dye, then emboss, and then put the polish on top of that afterwards, and that just softens it enough to give a good hold. <laughs> this is on vellum. The colour green that you see is simply because I laid it over a piece of card so you can see the result. What's nice with vellum is that as you emboss, the translucency turns to white, so you get a very, very clear, crisp image. And this is this is the line embossing. And this is the same design done with a fill. Again, you can see it very clearly there, the difference between the two. We have the etching and de-stressing tool. Go ahead and tell us about this. 
Okay, this was designed for people that were looking to distress some of the white core papers, how it started out, wanting to make it look aged around the edges if they were doing flowers, etc. And I believe that Rachel Ann is on here. I think she did some flowers originally. But white core paper is, well, is what we found to work best. The etching tool, the blue at the bottom, is what we use on the mirrored plastic to etch. And I tried to get a photo to show people today of that. It's impossible to photograph that mirrored plastic so I'm hopeful that we will get those one day and have Rob be able to show it maybe we'll have him etch one one night and then you'll be able to see it as it's etched it gives a very very nice look so this is basically what we covered I mean we covered we covered lots of tools uh, you know on this and what you guys can do with them and uh, I know Sherry and Dawn they both have something called the gotta have it all kit gotta have it all kit uh, we, we had a lot of people, you know, wanting us to, to put all the tools together so they didn't have to pay individual shipping. People had ordered one tool here, one tool there. So a lot of people were asking us that. We finally put it together and, and uh, in trying to come up with the name of it. Of course, for me, in U.S.-based, I, I just called it the Gotta Have It All kit because this is American. People got to have it all. I mean, it's most of what goes out the door is a 24-inch machine with the tables, with the Gotta Have It All kit, and sometimes the rolling stand. So kind of just as a play on words, that's where, that's where the name came from, and a lot of people ask us that in. Can I just interrupt here? Yes. We've missed out the detail blade holder. Oh yeah, that's oh. right. But we, yep. we talked about the detail blade. We just didn't we did. talk about the holder. Just that it's it's a different holder. It doesn't take the standard blades. It does take those very, very fine blades with the spring, and it's extremely good for detailed, intricate cutting. Yeah, a lot of our graphic artists that are looking to get laser cut uh, will often use that blade set. For getting that detailed cutting. However, I always suggest to them, try the 45 and 60 degree blade because we get some pretty phenomenal things. Hopefully we're going to show sometime in, in the near future here something that Rachel Ann has done that pretty much amazed people using the 45 degree blade. It's a 3D baby shoe that has amazed many people, so we're going to be showing that here in the future. If, if you guys are ever wondering where you guys can get a lot more, a lot of this information, uh, you know, there, there's the silverbulletcutters.com. They have the distributor links up there as well. So if you're trying to order from the UK, you'll be taken over to Dawn's, Dawn's website. If you're ordering from the US, you'll be taken to Sherry's website. So those links are on there as well. They do have uh, that, that great video out there if you're wanting to take a look at what the, what the Silver Bullet is, what it does. And of course, they have a photo gallery on there on that website as well, showing you all the cool projects that you can and what you can actually do with this machine. So, so we're going to cut this off. Unless you guys have any, any more questions, uh, feel free to post. Um, all right, and we just have a great job, great information. Uh, thank yeah. you. All uh, right. So... I guess we'll see you next time, guys. Uh, thanks for coming out. Thanks for everybody. Thanks, everybody. Sleep well.